No pressure following Quentin at all. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Well, what a morning it started with at Times Square. The moment is now for NFTs, it seems. Um, I'm Melissa Chu. I'm director of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, part of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Modern Art, and we're on the National Mall. And I come to you with my colleagues, Marina Isgro, who is our curator of new media art at the Hirshhorn Museum, Michael Ju, who is an artist based here in Brooklyn, and Anne Bracegirdle, who is with Metaversal. And we, in some ways, represent the art world in its different ecology. As museums, we've often had to deal with artworks that are intangible. And I often think of this work here, and I'm going to show you just to set some historical context, this work. Looks a bit like an old bottle, doesn't it? Well, this is an artist who, nearly a hundred years ago, thought to capture air. This is one of the artworks by an artist called Marcel Duchamp that changed art. Exactly. thought that art didn't need to be made by an artist. And the fundamental like principle... Like oh. Oh. And the fundamental principle was that art is an idea. And I think that that's the cultural idea behind NFTs. And that, in fact, is the big cultural change that needs to happen in order for people to understand what NFTs are all about. So if it's about the idea and intangible, how do we help people to understand that? The art world's been doing this now for nearly 100 years. And it's true that collectors, museums, and the ecology around the art world 100 years ago didn't quite know what to do with an artist like Marcel Duchamp. But today, his works are in all the major museums around the world. And many artists have taken that radical art as idea concept to fruition. So if we think to 50 years later, the idea of conceptual art took hold. And it was artists like this one here, Sol Lewitt, who began to think about art as not an object at all, but an act. And when you acquired his work, you received a certificate, much like you see here, and instructions. And so anyone trained could execute this work of art. And so these are the kinds of um, issues that artists, curators, and museums deal with every day. And I always think of, when we think of new ideas, we think of a transitional moment. And in a way, we are in that transitional moment. There's always a story that's told about the transition between horse and cart and automobiles. And some of the first automobiles had horses' heads painted on them. And that was just simply to help us, to help people understand that things were changing and moving along, but it needed to have something of the old world 
and the new world. And I like to think of my work at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art as a museum that was founded nearly 50 years ago in the 20th century. And yet our responsibility is to acquire art that's being done right to this moment and how we collect it and preserve it forever. And that's one of the questions that I have for our first speaker, Marina Isgro. She's a curator who was, in a way, trained in these kinds of new media, whether it's video art, computer art, or even performance art, that most intangible of art forms, where some artists like Tino Segal don't even allow for a certificate or any paperwork at all. It is a verbal communication with the museum that is charged with preserving and keeping that work alive forever. So Marina, my first question to you is, as a curator with in some ways a custodian's role, once we acquire a work, it's a promise forever. How do you think about artworks that are intrinsically intangible? How do you think about keeping them alive? That's a great question. Thank you, Melissa. So as you mentioned, longevity is really at the heart of the museum model. Um, when we purchase something, we commit to keeping that object and caring for it essentially in perpetuity. So selling or deaccessioning work, for example, is very much frowned upon in the museum world, um, as is letting a work of art decay or disappear. Um, and I think we have learned lessons from the digital art of the past. For example, in the 1990s, a lot of artists were producing what was called net art. So um, usually interactive or participatory works that actually existed on the internet. Um, and as browsers and various things became obsolete over the years, a lot of that work was just lost completely. So now there are some specialist organizations like Rhizome that are trying to sort of locate those works and recreate them. But I think a lot of curators are a little bit scared um, by that history. And for example, when I think about NFTs, what I want to think about is the stability of different marketplaces, um, the stability of cryptocurrencies, and um, of image hosting services. Those are all problems that we are going to have to solve before museums really begin to collect NFTs. Um, and I want to say something else about longevity. Um, again, the museum model is to purchase something once and then hold on to it forever. Whereas what I think is interesting about NFTs is that they facilitate transfer and circulation. You know, in many ways, they're a market innovation, right? Um, and I think some of the most interesting NFTs, like the one that Michael will tell us about that he's working on, um, really thematize that aspect of the form. Um, so for example, every time they're sold, they'll develop a new feature or change in some way. Um, so what I'm thinking about as a museum curator is how could we, in theory, collect NFTs while acknowledging and honoring that part of the form? Um, and that's a problem that we haven't solved yet but that I'm interested in working on. Um, and museums at this point are going to have to deal with this problem. The ICA Miami was recently the first museum to um, accession or accept into its collection an NFT when one of its trustees donated a crypto punk. So uh, we're, we're working on it, we're thinking about it, and we're, we're eager to learn from all of you. Thanks, Marina. I think this is a good segue to Michael, who is an artist based here. And Michael has often created work that straddles both science and art. And you are right now, Michael, creating an NFT as art. So tell us more about what NFTs offer you as an artist. Um, thanks, Melissa. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, and I'm relatively new to this space. So um, please pardon any kind of um, overreach or misuse of uh, language. but. Uh, I do think it's important for me to, to stress here that I'm up here representing in this context with uh, a new NFT project, uh, a, a collaborative effort 
which I think is one of the real hallmarks of what this NFT as a space offers to me as an artist. Um, a truly collaborative effort, and I'm, I'm working with artist, digital artist and um, uh, Daniel Kriberuchko, as well as uh, snark.art, the digital art production platform, along with a team of, you know, fantastic team of developers um, to make this uh, project. A lot of my personal um, gallery and museum type work uh, does deal with things that are unfixed and uh, in motion and talk about individuals uh, in larger communities. And one of the, th the other things in this collaborative effort that I think is uh, so striking is the ability for this medium and arena to build community. I think there are a lot of things within the, um, the artwork in the gallery and museums that does deal with having, you know, kind of offering an individual experience. Um, and in this NFT space, there is something that's uniquely individual and yet shared in a kind of uh, commonality of, of aspiration and interest in gathering around um, an NFT um, as a community and slowly kind of building an understanding of that um, uh, project as a, almost a hearth or campfire around which to share other ideas um, and around which to develop a belief in the, uh, the project itself. So that community, I think, is, is really incredible. And with that community building is um, something that is also, I think, unique to um, in-person and in real life artwork uh, or art viewing, which is, is reach. And one of the, the things that's really amazing about the community we've developed in this project is a community of 40,000 um, online server members uh, supporting and talking about this project, um, even as it developed before its release. Um, I should backtrack for a moment to say that um, the project itself called Organic Growth Crystal Reef um, is a generative art project um, related to my other work and also uh, kind of um, an extension of my collaborator, Daniel Kriberuchko's work as well in developing generative work that doesn't stay fixed or an NFT that grows and continues to develop even after it's been sold or purchased. So what we've done is taken 10,301, um, a kind of palindromic prime number, release of seed crystals, which will um, apply themselves to or take the digital um, data, the crypto wallet data from the individual buyer and apply an algorithm or series of algorithms to develop and uniquely profile using crystallography and other kind of principles of reef growth, coral reef growth, um, coral reef being the crystallized exoskeletons of coral polyps um, in this kind of, in these normally um, ir, um, unreachable develop, development spaces of the ocean or underground. And so in this digital space, which we're kind of equating with that growth, growth um, um, arena, each of these 10,000 crystals uh, takes the data and in real time um, uh, via 20 render farms individually renders each one into a completely unique uh, form. And these unique forms uh, don't stop there. With each successive sale up to seven generations, the crystals themselves will again reapply themselves to the new data and transform and continue until two months or seven generations where they'll become fixed. And so in a way we're playing with the idea that things aren't static and in this kind of um, place or space of NFTs, we're really interested in doing something kind of bold and different. Um, I know there are a number of projects dealing with this, but perhaps not at the scale that we're tackling it right now. And so, you know, we're really proud as a team of having accomplished this idea at this, this scale, um, real-time rendering this, um, these crystals to individual data sets. And another of the things that really uh, is exciting to me about this space is the idea of um, the reach of the project having an impact, an imprint on, on the outside world. And one of the things that we're able to do with this project was to um, uh, work with and collaborate with uh, coral reef research facilities at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And it's exciting that we can have a kind of philanthropic but research-based um, relationship. And so our work and with the project was fed um, uh, in terms of ideas and research and actual, actual information 
by the, uh, with the help of the Institute. And it's an ongoing relationship in which uh, even the outcome which of this uh, artwork, which will be a sculpture uh, that uh, is the kind of physical realization of all 10,000 of these crystals into a large-scale work, um, is now even being um, fed and inspired by data that this research vessel is now giving to, providing us with. Thanks, Michael. I think, Anne, you've done a lot at Christie's, which is uh, one of the two major auction houses here in New York City. Um, you've been in the marketplace um, as well as curation. So in some ways, you're uh, the per panelist here with most of the marketplace um, knowledge and expertise. And it would be true to say that NFTs made the headlines um, mostly because of the sale of an important NFT. Um, so where do you see NFTs within that art marketplace world? It's a big question. Um, so I think, you know, my, my background was in, as Melissa mentioned, the commercial art world, and I didn't quite realize how centralized it was, you know, being in it, working at Christie's for so long, um, until I discovered the, the crypto community and the NFT digital art community in 2017, and it really opened my eyes to the, the future of what the art world could be and how it could be open to be so much more accessible to, you know, have all of the information be transparent, transparent values, transparent provenance, you know, transparent additions, et cetera. And I, that's really what grabbed me and why I fell in love with blockchain and with the potential of NFTs, because I saw the future of the arts that really embraced equity and embraced decentralization and, you know, embraces the ethos of, like, literally why we're all here today. And I was... Um, speaking to someone last night in the space, and we were talking about, I'd, we'd never met before, and we were talking about how there's something really unique about the depth of the friendships that you meet in, the, in this Web3 universe and in this crypto environment. And, and I think that what we're seeing now is this moment where what, the market is, nat, is naturally, and I'm thinking like the auction market in particular, is embracing this, but it still seems like it's for, it's for the benefit of themselves, right? And it's for the benefit of like, the middle people that represents the centralized art world. And I think we're at this really interesting pivotal moment now where the reality is that the, the power of the future of the commercial art market lies in the people here. It lies in the people who own the assets, who own the NFTs that they want to sell. It lies in like the community that has the potential to drive the future of the arts to align with what we all believe in. And even though it's hard to believe that because you're, you know, moved by the names, by the brands, by what it means to like be aligned with a name like Christie's or Sotheby's. And this is by no means, again, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my time there. I, I, of course, believe in everything they do. However, I think there is this unique power dynamic right now where we have the capacity as the crypto sellers and the crypto buyers to say, listen, we're not going to consign with you unless you give more community access to the buyers of your sale. If all of the buyers in your sale have determination like to decide what's in your next auction or prove that you're creator first, prove their community first, you know, what are you doing to help the crypto community, the digital artist community? Are you waiving their sellers fees or are you charging their sellers fees? Like that is what I think I hope for the future is that we see this like, them rebuilding their brand to be crypto native, not rebuilding to keep the middlemen in control in the center of this. Um, and I hope, I mean, naturally, everyone is probably trying to recruit Noah from Christie's right now. And our hope is that, you know, Noah can stay there. You know, Noah's in the community, Noah gets it. Um, and so I believe that like with him leading the charge there, they can start to think about ways to be more inclusive and more community driven and, and again, prioritize the ethos that drives all of us and not the ethos that has driven the very centralized art market you know forever so I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes yeah I think um, it, it's kind of an interesting moment in so many ways because as recent auctions have revealed some of the artists who we revere as artists who were foremost making work in new forms of technology, and I think of Namjoon Peck as one of them, or even Warhol, right? His silk screens, his attitude towards making. 
And yet they haven't necessarily translated into NFTs in the way that you might have thought. So I, I guess, and just to follow up this a little further, right now there's a bit of a schism between the NFT collecting world and the con more conventional art collecting world. What do you think would need to happen for them to kind of come together, for them to coalesce? That's a great question. I think, um, I think it's going to take, you know, education and time. Um, and I think, um, you know, giving, giving each side access to the other side. And I think that the, you know, people within the tradition, also getting beyond just like that, for the traditional industry and the traditional collectors to get beyond just the hype of what this like, you know, like on like the Beeple sale, for instance, and actually understanding like the community nature behind these projects and really taking a minute to understand that just in the way that you shared that Duchamp piece, like the depth behind what that piece represents, the depth behind Michael's projects, like you to have traditional collectors realize like if you give yourself some time to invest intellectually in these projects and understand like they're literally creating the future of the economy and the future of creation, like I think it's just going to take some time to educate and and you know, more access and et cetera. Um, what do you think? Uh, well, that's what I was going to turn yeah. to Marina because yeah. a similar situation exists today where some of those auction breaking prices that we've all observed are by artists who are not well known to curators at museums. Right. So what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, let's see, I think the art world obviously is quite risk averse, the traditional art world. Um, and slow to change, and that's for a reason, again, because of our commitment to, you know, stewarding these artworks essentially in perpetuity. Um, so I think um, part of the problem is that we only buy from really a small pool of art galleries right now, and those galleries have not yet adopted the NFT format. You know, there are some sort of more traditional digital art galleries like Bitforms that are starting to use NFTs more regularly. But it hasn't become the default for a lot of galleries that show digital video, for example. And I think once that starts happening, which it probably will, then you will start seeing NFTs really coming into museum collections. Right now, I think you see them in kind of the gift shop model where people are tokenizing um, works of art from the collection like you might sell posters or postcards, right? But they're not becoming integrated into the actual permanent collections and treated as distinct pieces of art. Um, and then last I would say, this just goes back to that question of why, why should we acquire something as an NFT as opposed to just a digital file? Why is it important for a museum to acquire an NFT? And so for me, as a curator, I'm really looking for um, artworks that engage with the nature of NFTs as this potentially market tool, as a community tool, um, along the lines of what Michael is doing right now. Um, so that's sort of where I am. Yeah. And then Michael, the creative process, how was it different creating an NFT as opposed to creating an object? Because your practice already has collaboration at its center. When you commission a glass blower, commission um, somebody to weld a sculpture, that, that already happens in a way. So what's different about that NFT making collaboration for you? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's at the center of it. In a lot of the collaborative work that I do, um, it's often a case where I do need to have my hands on it in order to understand the language, if only to work together along with an expert, but also to shape and exploit those mistakes that, that occur. And what's exciting to me inside of, I think, this NFT space is, um, and, and essential is a, a kind of three main points. And I think one is the of recalibration of one's aesthetics because there isn't that sense of encounter with material that you have in this digital space, the kind of presence. And recalibrating the aesthetics to kind of begin to understand that and adjust to what this, what that um, NFT work and tr mechanism means to you or how it can open up is really important. The next thing to me was probably an idea of um, kind of rethinking um, your um, identifying and 
kind of, I guess, committing to the, a medium and what the medium is of NFTs. I mean, I think it's largely, it, it, it does involve things that the art world has tended to kind of poo-poo and, 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 and see as, as, as um, distracting from the art, such as the transactional or the idea of sales, the idea of talking about it at the center. I mean, I think in a way, sales and trade have always had a huge social function, you know, from agrarian times. And I think in some ways, maybe there's a way to heighten that and bring up the social good or the, the positive social aspects of trade within the sphere. If you see that as a medium, I think, within our, within our project in particular, then, then, then it becomes a polymorphous material, you know, to tackle it and, and how it operates as raw material, almost something kind of polymorphous. And the last thing I'd say is, is kind of, for me, the idea of rethinking the, the role that concept has in the overall process of developing an artwork. I mean, for me, concept leads first, um, often and sometimes to, you know, uh, at odds with what comes out. And in some ways, my work is to have the viewer experience the same revelation that I had in putting together the picture of how this idea and why it should be manifested. In, in the NFT space, what I found with the project that's so exciting is this concept has a role all through the process. Um, since we, we began talking about the project and releasing it before the actual launch, um, using, not using Twitter or normal kinds of hype engines and letting it grow kind of organically from the concept, we were able to build a community that, again, is anticipating or waiting for the sculpture that is the, one of the possible outcomes of this generative artwork um, to be realized. And so I love the idea that, in a way, in this kind of increasingly material world, we're, we might be realizing a massive sculpture that is really something more related to anticipation and desire than to demand, mm -hmm. as we know it. That's a great note to end on. Please join me in thanking our panelists today. Marina, Michael, and Anne, thanks for being with us. Bye.